But hey, that's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. Hey you, you look like you're interested in some FNAF lore. Sick of all the speculation? Do you want something that's undeniably canon? Oh. Well, that's too bad. I'm telling you anyway. <laughs>was 1983, January to be exact. Local nobodies Henry Emily and William Afton were walking down the streets of Hurricane Utah, when suddenly they noticed that not once in their life have they ever caught a glimpse of a yellow grizzly bear. It was then their fates were sealed, and they knew that they must fulfill their destiny. Henry and William were something of robotics enthusiasts, so they finally used their untapped potential to create the most realistic animatronic bear imaginable. On their first attempt, they made a decrepit, muddy yellow bear with giant teeth and claws. This wasn't realistic. William, however, remembered that in the trunk of his car rested a cluster of discs that could emit audio frequencies that would fool people into seeing real bears. They slapped those bad boys on this animatronic, and suddenly it took the form of the beautiful golden grizzly, who they then named Ferdinand von Bernard. Not only did he look the part and have a voice like honey butter, but the mind-altering audio accidentally gave him sentience and cosmic power beyond our human understanding. This was very dangerous, but the partners in furry shenanigans were not swayed. That is, until the entire town evacuated at the sight of this golden beast. Turns out, people are scared of loose bears. Who would have thunk it? Of course, this fear wasn't for nothing. Ferdinand was caught dining on a local restaurant owner, and he fled from the crime scene before law enforcement could get to him. William and Henry realized they had been a slight bit overzealous with their first creation. Good thing is, literally nobody knew or cared who they were, so they got away with this scot-free. Later that month, they designed an animatronic simply based on Ferdinand's likeness. This character was quite a downgrade, being both simpler and stupider. This didn't matter to the duo, though, as they loved their creation. And with that, Fredbear was born. At first, they had nowhere to actually put him, so they opted for the dump. He was truly a diamond in the rough. Amazingly, this attempt at entertainment was amusing enough to the citizens of Hurricane that they gave William and Henry enough money to afford a recently vacated diner space. Fredbear was going to be a star. Unfortunately, this animatronic was extremely poorly designed, and their attempts at granting him artificial intelligence quickly turned sour. On February 31st, 1983, his first performance on stage in front of children prompted him to spontaneously combust from a nervous breakdown. William and Henry, heartbroken at this tragic event, cracked down to ensure this would never happen again. This also prompted William to threaten the United States government, and they met his demands to strike February 31st from the calendar forever. After that, they set their sights on making something with no flaws. But then they made Springlock suits. In an attempt to both ease the animatronic's nerves and not allow them their legally required breaks, Henry and William created mechanisms that could lock the endoskeleton parts to the inner edges of the suit for a person to climb inside and cover for the character. For extra safety precautions, they created a partner for the new Fredbear 2.0 to ease his nerves. For some reason, the best name they came up with for Fredbear's partner was Spring Bonnie. William was insistent on this name, and Henry felt too threatened to argue against it. Where the safety precautions ended, however, was the fact that the spring locks holding the endoskeleton pieces away from a person's vital organs were made out of paper clips, and the lightest sneeze could set them off. Truly brilliant inventors, those two. The dynamic duo had now created a dynamic duo. William was the only one who had the nerve to actually test the spring lock suit, and it turned out he enjoyed dancing around as a yellow rabbit a little too much. Henry was unbothered by this, though, as William was still perfectly capable of handling their finances in character. A few months had gone by and Fredbear's Family Diner was an absolute success. Not only were Fredbear and Spring Bonnie beloved by the now enlightened Mormon population of Utah, William even managed to lock in a deal with a low-budget animation studio in order to make a cartoon called Fredbear and Friends. The one downside, though, was the studio needed more characters and they refused any more yellow ones. Out of obligation, Leopold, Theodore, Mirabella, and Foxy were created. No, Mirabella's not yellow, she's Xanthophil. You're just seeing things. Surely these blights to everything William and Henry stood for would never see the light of day in any other context. William and Henry were at their peak, and William finally regained custody of his children. However, one of his sons, whose name has been stricken from the record, waltzed into the back room of Fredbear's and saw Fredbear smoking a cigar. Fredbear's blatant nonchalance about his respiratory health was truly traumatizing for the child. In a panic, the child started to run out the door but accidentally tripped over the foot of Spring Bonnie. Unbeknownst to him, 
the animatronic was being worn by Harold the janitor, and this collision was enough to snap open the flimsy spring locks and impale Harold every which way. Harold's soul, heartbroken by his untimely demise and his boss's backup fursuit, transformed into pure agony and he became a shadow creature. He gave himself a really cool name, but unfortunately he never learned how to spell, so it came out like this. Shockingly okay with witnessing this occur, the child went home and invited his older brother, Michael, to play a game of Uno with him. However, there was foul play. This child was actually just a terrible human being and slid extra cards into the deck, causing Michael to draw four eight turns in a row. Enraged, Michael threw on a foxy mask and started screeching at the child. The child, annoyed by his behavior, decided to humor Mike until he got bored of doing this and pretended to sob 24-7. Maybe, just maybe, this would guilt trip him. However, Michael was far more resilient than the child anticipated, and this behavior kept going for a whole week. The child, craving literally anything else to do with his time, walked into Fredbear's again in an attempt to face his fears before getting cornered by Trevor the cashier wearing a Fredbear suit. The child saw the reasoning for this, as Trevor was holding a mat for a mediocre dentist's office in his hand, and so the child deliberately ran into Trevor to set off the spring locks in his suit. Trevor's spirit, a bit relieved by the matter in all honesty, turned into a more chill shadow creature that just kind of walked around convincing people to join his conga line. The child returned home, completely okay with the fact he just killed a man, and told his Fredbear plushie everything he did. The next day, Michael and his Uno buddies barged into the child's room to take him to Fredbear's for his birthday. The child was still committing to the crying act, but this was a bad idea as it just made them come up with the idea of shoving him in Fredbear's mouth. So. Uh, that's exactly what they did. They mockingly told the child to give Fredbear a big kiss, which the animatronic took immediate notice of. This was a very dangerous situation for his career, so without thinking, Fredbear clamped down his jaw on the child's skull. This terrified Michael and his friends for about five seconds, until the child hopped out of it unscathed. Turns out, William and Henry gave the animatronics rubber teeth. Great safety feature. The child was livid and threatened to do the job again. Mike didn't really know what this meant, but it sounded scary enough for his buddy Jeremy Fitzgerald II to knock the child unconscious with a chair. This only distressed Michael more, so he rushed the child to the hospital where he was diagnosed with a mild concussion. When the child awoke, he looked at Michael and told him that he never existed. When Michael asked what that was supposed to mean, the child fused with him and turned a little bit paler. This was just a very bad day for Michael. When he went to tell William about it, William had no clue what he meant by little brother. He told Mike to stop making up stories, trash that disrespectful mask, and take up engineering. This sounded good enough for him, so that's what he did. But, turns out, the employees at Fredbear's called the police, because Harold and Trevor's bodies were just laying on the floor, and nobody cared to do anything about it until right then. So, the restaurant was shut down, and the news media blamed it on the bite of 83 in order to abruptly end Fredbear's career. They were just jealous. William and Henry were back to square one. Because of the abundant controversy and investigations, they laid low for a couple of years. But in 1985, they finally opened a new location. With the amount of money they had earned from Fredbear's, they were luckily capable of buying out a new restaurant space with ease. Unfortunately, Fredbear was publicly executed two years prior. So William and Henry did the unthinkable. They made animatronics of the cartoon characters they had made out of reluctant necessity. Leopold was their immediate decision for the new mascot, as he was actually a bear. He wasn't golden, but he would do. But that name didn't exactly resonate with the public, so after five seconds of brainstorming, they renamed him Freddy Fazbear. The initial plan was for him to be partnered with Spring Bonnie, but William refused to work with any type of grizzly that wasn't golden. So, Henry opted to rebrand Theodore to simply Bonnie, and that worked well enough. However, making these two characters so derivative of their superior counterparts worried Henry and William, as the public could possibly see through their ruse. So, they added another character to the band to distract people. Mirabella! Given the fact that she didn't have overtly feminine characteristics though, Henry and William renamed her Chica to make sure any Spanish speakers knew she was a girl. There was one last cartoon character they could use, being Foxy the Pirate. This was a gimmick that the Fredbear and Friends show added to drive up ratings. Henry was fine with the concept, but William hated it. For the time being, the partners settled on shoving him in the corner of the building, far away from the three they actually tolerated. After opening the location, however, the two quickly realized that children didn't actually care about the three stage performers. Something about theming being more interesting. As more and more children flocked around Foxy's Pirate Cove, William immediately ran up and kicked the poor animatronic in the kneecaps. This put him out of order for the time being, and William tore him up after closing to ensure it would stay that way. Somehow this didn't scare anyone away, and everyone just immediately piled back over to watch Freddy sing about bullfighting. 
Henry and William were truly living the life. They lost their beloved golden animals, sure, but they were still happy. That is, until one fateful day. Hey, can I borrow five dollars? Yeah, sure. Well, not actually this specific day. It was two days after this that things fell to pieces. William, after a long day of work, was extremely hungry. You may be wondering why he didn't just eat dinner at Freddy's, but truth be told, he hated the pizza there. They blew all their budget on good tablecloths. So, instead, he opted to drive down to a local rundown Carl's Jr. on that fateful rainy Tuesday night. Hello, I'd like an original Angus burger and a large Coca-Cola. That'll be five dollars, please. This was the moment that William Afton snapped. Where are my five dollars? In a fit of rage, William sped one mile over the speed limit and pulled up at Freddy's to enact revenge on Henry. However, by pure chance, Henry's daughter Charlie was locked out of the building. William, attempting to help her back in, looked at her in the eyes trying to explain his plight. However, with the rage in his heart at that very moment, his mere stare was a death sentence. Charlie flopped over immediately from this. William, panicking over this murder, threw her in the alley next to the restaurant and drove off before anyone could see what had happened. After this, the restaurant's security puppet, designed to keep track of the children assigned to it, walked out of the building to find Charlie. When it got to her body, her soul grew an attachment to the character, and she stuck around in hopes a new body would be made so she could fuse with it. You'd expect for this to be the end, but the sudden realization of his true power gave William an idea. With his instantaneous death stare, he could quickly and quietly send a horrible message to Henry. He circled back around to Freddy's and made a beeline toward the safe room that contained the retired Springlock suits. He quickly equipped his Spring Bonnie suit and darted around the restaurant telling kids that their dead dogs were alive in the safe room with Old Man Jenkins. None of them actually had dogs, but they all assumed that they'd managed to get a free one anyway. Of course, they realized very quickly that they were conned. William waltzed into the safe room with five total children inside, but before he could do anything, the child named Cassidy kicked him in the shin so hard it knocked the pink out of him. Luckily, he duct taped the spring locks to the edges of his suit so they couldn't go off, but he was still made livid by this attempt on his life, so he stared down each one and took them out. William wondered if perhaps he had gone overboard with his evil deeds, but figured that five children for five dollars was a reasonable trade-off. As a disclaimer to all of you at home, murder is bad. Meanwhile, a drunk man named Dave Miller had just been turned away from juniors and drove home. He was a terrible father and insisted on invading his son's privacy for the heinous act of the boy. Locking his door. The boy, whose name was Andrew, broke his window and left the house. Turns out, Trevor the cashier, at this point dubbing himself Shadow Freddy, convinced Andrew to participate in his conga line to Freddy's. Unfortunately, Shadow Freddy's favorite spot to wrap up his conga lines was the safe room, and the two just so happened to come in as William finished stuffing four of the children into the animatronic suits. William, surprised by a sudden extra child, accidentally gave him the death stare and now he was left with an extra body to stuff. And to make things more inconvenient, there weren't any more characters to pick from. This, however, is when he realized that he could just stuff both Cassidy and Andrew into the Fredbear suit. William knew nobody actually wore the thing, so he was certain it would go completely unnoticed. After this, he left the building like nothing happened and drove home to sleep in his safe and comfy Spring Bonnie pajama suit. It was getting to be an obsession. After this point, Henry was very obviously devastated. However, he had no idea who actually did it. The cameras were broken and the only accusations were that someone did it while in a mascot costume. Police promptly arrested a man from a completely unrelated pizzeria. Fortunately, Freddy's didn't get shut down for this, and Henry attempted to keep things going for a while. William had sent him a letter saying he was off on vacation for the time being, so Henry was left to handle finances on his lonesome. But, uh, people rapidly started losing interest at Freddy's. The animatronics smelled horrible and everyone finally noticed just how bad the pizza tasted. So, by year's end, the restaurant shut down. Henry decided to take a break from it all, and when William returned from vacation, he realized he could seize this opportunity and make a pizzeria with complete creative control. His daughter, Elizabeth, served as the perfect muse, and he proceeded to make an animatronic that looked nothing like her. He named it Circus Baby. Don't ask why, it's not elaborated on. However, after telling Elizabeth all about this animatronic, he suddenly got the idea to use Baby for a different purpose than simple entertainment. William had recently noticed the animatronics from the closed Freddy's location acting strange, and upon further investigation, he discovered a substance that he called Remnant. His new idea entailed having Baby and a new set of animatronics themed after her work together in order to collect more Remnant from children. So, he made Funtime Freddy and Bon Bon for easy marketing appeal. Then, he finally remade Foxy in his own vision, stripping all of that filthy pirate gimmick from him and making him a lovely coat of white and pink. 
Funtime Foxy was superior in every way, and his lack of originality meant that nobody would prefer her over the characters William actually wanted people to like. Finally, William made a character named Ballora. This one wasn't made for murder purposes so much as it was made out of contempt. For who? His ex-wife, Eleanor Schmidt. He craved to make an animatronic that was better at ballet than her. She was an accountant, so this was easy. However, upon coming to William's house to pick up Elizabeth for a week, Eleanor saw what he was building. Angered by the fact that this character was better at ballet than her, a woman who never once thought about it until right then, she fused with Valora in a fit of rage, and now William was stuck with a robot wife that danced around his workshop every day. But no matter. William secured a building to open this brand new sister location of Freddy's named Circus Baby's Pizza World, and progress was going smoothly. He had some test runs of the pizzeria and let some groups of people come there early for birthday parties. But this plan quickly turned sour as Elizabeth joined a party and ignored his specific demands not to see Baby. To William's surprise, children don't listen to you if you say not to play with something they want. As a result, Baby's murder equipment activated as soon as Elizabeth was alone with her. William instantly shut down development on the restaurant. He was very distraught over this, which maybe he should have considered before trying to murder more children. Despite the local population being completely confused by this sudden turn of events, William blamed it on gas leaks and never spoke of it and instead went back to Henry for them to start work on a new Freddy's location. For a while, they planned on just fixing up the old animatronics from the previous location and scrubbing them down to fix the odor problem. However, William caught sight of Foxy and formed a new idea in his head out of pure hatred. He told Henry his idea for the new design philosophy of the animatronics he had in mind. He introduced a newfangled plastic finish, flashy makeup, and to top it all off, William unleashed his newfound obsession with prefixes and dubbed them toy animatronics. In order to further justify this decision, he also proposed bringing back the security puppet character as just a normal marionette, and finally created the hero of this universe, Balloon Boy. Getting all of that out of the way, William went straight to explaining to Henry why Foxy needed to be white and pink. And with that, the new face of Freddy's was underway. The location opened in 1987 with a lot of good press, and people were flocking to it. Why did they put so much trust in this new location? Simple. Henry and William advertised that there would no longer be terrible pizza. This is because they got rid of the kitchen. This restaurant had no food. You'd think this would be a problem, but kids really like to go there for the characters alone. And by characters, I mean character as even despite William's every last effort of making Foxy relevant, the kids now flocked to Toy Foxy's Kid's Cove to tear him apart and put her back together. They thought they could make him look better, but without technical experience, she looked less like a pirate and more like a metal tumbleweed. William had now found a new rage spurred by Foxy's mere existence, and so he enacted a second missing children's incident to cripple the restaurant's success. This time, however, Henry had been paying attention. He saw the camera recordings of Spring Bonnie luring children to the safe room and realized that William was behind this the entire time. He immediately fired William and told him to never show his face again. William realized that this was a big problem. Henry may have let him off easy by not calling the authorities, but if anyone else checked anything, he'd be caught for sure. So, after ruffling through old newspapers about his murders to see if he liked any of the parents' names, he stole the name Dave Miller and applied for a job as a night guard at the location. Using this position, he tampered with the facial recognition scanners they implemented in the animatronics and wiped the camera recordings clean. On top of this, he beat up all of the old animatronics just to put them in their place after seeing Freddy walk around. He even tore off Bonnie's face for not being deserving of the mantle he once bore. Bonnie, possessed by Lil Jeremy Fitzgerald, was merely a prophecy of more face trauma to come for that bloodline. After getting done with that, William could have sworn he saw the puppet floating around whispering to everything it could see. This made him wonder if this was actually Charlie, but he didn't care enough to check, so he left it alone. The new set of children, though? William hadn't bothered actually stuffing them anywhere, so the puppet guided them to select new vessels of their own. Instead of individual characters like it was expecting, though, all of them voluntarily possessed Balloon Boy just because it was mildly amusing. William, still presenting as Dave, tried to maintain a job as a day shift guard after this, but was quickly fired for having bad vibes. Also, he kept going into the parts and service room to kick the old Foxy animatronic in the shins. Now that the night guard position was open, what if Michael Afton's old Uno buddies applied for the job? Jeremy Fitzgerald II. He was actually pretty decent at it, but it got extremely stressful because Balloon Boy staged a coup against him with the other animatronics. So, once the week was over, he transferred over to the day shift position. Balloon Boy wasn't going to let Jeremy get away free, though, and proceeded to publicly attack him and bite out his frontal lobe. Wow. That face trauma prophecy came true quickly. But hey, don't worry, it grew back within a month. But this incident, dubbed the Bite of 87, 
was enough to finally get the establishment closed. On the night after this attack, they needed a guard to make sure Balloon Boy didn't escape. Instead of behaving though, local menace Fritz Smith tampered with all the animatronics and made them extremely aggressive just because he thought it'd be funny. Company higher-ups didn't appreciate this and quickly took care of the problem. Thus, 1987 ended with another location shut down abruptly. Henry scrapped all the toy animatronics after this except for Toy Freddy and the puppet. Turns out Toy Freddy was already retiring as he really wanted to become a gamer. His endeavors were successful and he led a happy life. The puppet, meanwhile, just vanished. Henry, spooked by the idea of a sock monkey with a clown mask coming back to haunt him, started making blueprints for a counterattack if that day ever came. Now, Henry had his sights set on repairing and reusing the old animatronics for one last attempt at the pizzeria business without William in his way. However, this plan was easier said than done. Henry, with all of his financial incompetence, had next to no funds to enact this idea. So, he briefly attempted a public fund to try and get money. After a day of trying, he gave up with exactly zero dollars earned. Henry was broke, sure, but he had some powerful resolve. So, he decided to steal back the building he and William used in 1985 to recycle for his new pizzeria. Despite this being very much illegal, nobody actually wanted to use the building given its history, so the city decided not to bother Henry when he claimed it back as his. Being a one-man show, Henry had to take his sweet time renovating the place. But, after about a year, he managed to open it back up with somewhat new animatronics. And, to his surprise, he was actually moderately successful. Due to a dwindling bear population in Utah, there was growing demand to see one in person, and the populace reluctantly decided that Freddy Fazbear's Pizza was their best shot at doing so. Unfortunately, the working conditions were very much terrible. The most loyal employee of Fazbear Entertainment, only known by his co-workers as Phone Guy, was assassinated by the animatronics during his final week of working the night shift due to looking suspiciously purple. The good thing is, he had recorded a helpful guide on how to not get assassinated right before getting assassinated. Henry was not ready to let this casualty of his negligence ruin things for him though, so he covered up Phone Guy's death and business went as usual afterward. William, still being unemployed and bored, decided now was a good time to take revenge on Henry. Again. He realized that he still had an entire stockpile of animatronics he never got to use. With the power of legal loopholes, he managed to kickstart Circus Baby's entertainment and rentals. For suspiciously low prices, the average family could have a giant chrome animatronic shipped to their doorstep to throw parties for their children. What could go wrong? Well, baby's eyes were green. For a moment, William thought he just misremembered her eye color, but then she started talking to him about very personal matters, and he realized Elizabeth had possessed her. Instead of doing anything immediate to solve this problem, he locked her in the rental facility and wrote a note on the fridge to take care of it later. After a few more years, Michael Lafton finally graduated engineering school and came back home. William was delighted by his son's return, as he was conveniently useful for his newest plot against Henry. However, he wanted Michael to be fully prepared for what was to come, so William locked Mike into a crude replica of their house that vaguely resembled the layout of Freddy's. In this fake house, William had prepared a makeshift animatronics with dangerously high safety hazards to attack Michael so he could learn how to defend himself against the real deal. After roughly a week of watching Mike handle the process, William noticed something went wrong. Something broke into the fake house. Upon further investigation, he discovered some discarded audio discs lying on the ground. It was Ferdinand von Bernard! Having wandered the wilds of Utah for exactly a decade, he returned to Hurricane to wreak havoc on his creators. So. He targeted William's favorite, er, only, son using his unaltered form. But Mike was resilient, and he managed to avoid Ferdinand long enough that he got bored, reapplied his audio discs, and finally wandered away. Given the unplanned attack on Michael, William ended the testing process and gaslit Mike into believing it was all just a nightmare before changing the subject to getting a job. To ensure that Henry wouldn't tell Michael what he knows about his father, William told Mike that he should apply using his mother's maiden name rather than Afton. That way he doesn't draw attention to himself for being related to everyone's favorite former manager, of course. So, Mike Schmidt worked for a whole week at this place. The animatronics tried to assassinate him due to his good looks, or so he assumed. After working an extra night and being applauded by Henry, he was then instructed by William to sabotage the animatronics using his new engineering skills. Why do I need to disable their AI? It builds character. And Henry still owes me five dollars. Michael wasn't buying this, so he decided to do the exact opposite and crank them all up to the maximum setting to challenge himself for the end of his week. But, due to the animatronic scent rubbing off on him, Henry fired him for body odor and inadvertently caused a personal grudge. Before leaving, Mike snuck into the back and disabled all of the animatronic systems to spite Henry. 
Now that the animatronics didn't work, everyone stopped caring about Freddy's again. Henry's profits plummeted, and he was ultimately forced to shut the place down by the end of 1993. After hearing this news, William was ecstatic. He began marketing the Circus Baby rental service even harder, and proceeded to begin his final plan. William had needed Freddy's clothes for more reasons than just spite. The Funtime's Remnant collection was not working as frequently as he hoped, and if he wanted to understand the substance at all, he needed more of it quickly. So, he made sure he had free reign to tear apart the animatronics to harvest their remnant and leave. After sneaking into the now-abandoned Freddy's, he set up camp in the safe room since the animatronics were programmed not to go in there. But then he remembered Michael had completely deactivated them, and they would only move if the souls possessing them were motivated enough to. Luckily, Shadow Freddy suddenly appeared, and William bribed him to start a conga line leading into the safe room so he could dismantle all the animatronics. His plan worked flawlessly. In the animatronics' weakened state, William was able to tear them apart using nothing but his bare hands. Unfortunately for him, some of the remnants spilled and formed into the visible spirits of the missing children. Terrified that they might be able to kick him in the shins, he ran to his trusty spring bonnie suit and put it back on for the first time since 1987. Feeling empowered despite this accomplishing nothing, William began to laugh at the ghosts. But, in his self-indulgent celebration, he failed to realize that the duct tape holding back the spring locks had fallen off, and the leaky ceiling proceeded to snap them shut. The ghosts, finding his inconvenience hilarious, faded away for the time being so they could gossip about him elsewhere. While normally being impaled like this would result in immediate death, the spring lock failures these suits cause are painful enough to consistently cause so much agony that life is maintained in some way. While Harold the janitor got the short end of the stick and became a miserable shadow creature, William was now one with his beloved rabbit suit. Realizing he wasn't going to properly die anytime soon, William Afton came up with a new name for his new form. He called himself Springtrap. And with that, we end 